Hello, everyone. Happy Pride and welcome to this event. I'm Dr. Adam Gonzalez. I'm a gay clinical psychologist and the director of behavioral health at Stony Brook Medicine. I use he, him pronouns. I'm super excited to be here today with an amazing panel of friends and experts to discuss LGBTQ healthcare and why it's important to define and distinguish it from other forms of healthcare. During this panel discussion, we would love to hear from you. So please submit your questions, your comments, your thoughts in the chat box. We'll do our best to get back to you and answer your questions throughout the panel discussion. So let's get to know our panel a little bit more. I'm gonna turn it over first to Allie for her to introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Allison Ellisku. I'm the Chief of Adolescent Medicine at Stony Brook Children's and Stony Brook Medicine. And I'm also one of the co-chairs of Stony Brook Medicine's LGBTQ committee, uh, along with Adam and uh, Rose Carden, uh, who's the director of patient education at Stony Brook. All right, Susie. Hi, everyone. My name is Susie Marriott. I am currently the associate director of nursing here at Stony Brook Medicine, but I am transitioning into a new role at Stony Brook Eastern Long Island Hospital. I will be their chief nursing officer in a week and a half's time. Um, this work is important to me because, uh, and I identify as a queer woman. So this work is important to me because people from our community are often invisible and marginalized. Thanks, Susie. And Bob? Hello, everyone. Happy Pride Month as well. I'm Bob Challoner. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, located on the South Fork of Long Island. Um, I'm also thrilled to be here as a gay man. I feel very strongly about better health care for our community. I've been working in uh, this is the I'm celebrating my 40th month of hospital administration work. Um, and I'm thrilled that uh, in the last uh, decade, we've started to catch up with concerns and uh, better, better health care for the LGBTQ community. So thank you for being here. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, and thank you all for being with us again. Um, for me, it's really amazing that we get to have all of our hospitals come together for this important event. So Stony Brook University Hospital, Stony Brook Southampton, and Stony Brook Eastern Long Island Hospital. And we have some great representation um, across our health system. We have a number of topics and questions that we plan to cover throughout this event. And again, we'd really love to hear from you what's important, what you wanna know more about. So just drop your questions in the chat box. And again, we'll, we'll work and do our best to get to them throughout this event. So first up, uh, we're gonna be talking about LGBTQ mental health and, and self-advocacy. So as we know, it's June, it's Pride Month. Uh, what is LGBTQ Pride and why is this an important month for the community? So what would you guys say, why is this, why is this important? I'll jump in quickly, Adam, I think that, um, Pride is uh, it's it's a way to to make our community more visible. For so many years, we we had to hide in the shadows, um, and Pride is an opportunity for the community to come together and with one voice um, stand up and and say that not only are we uh, no longer going to hide, but we're going to stand up and demand our rights, um, and that includes better health care. And uh, that's why I think it's an important month for all of us. Thanks, Bob. I think in, as an adolescent medicine provider, seeing a lot of uh, young, uh, young children or adolescents or young teens who are starting to try to understand their gender identity or sexual orientation, seeing, uh, seeing adults who are proud of, uh, of who they are, proud of their identity, able to come out and share um, and really be proud of it, I think is a really good example for young adolescents going through this transition period too. I think it's very important. Yeah, and it's also a good opportunity for anyone really from the LGBTQ plus community to try it on, um, maybe to come out for the first time, maybe even to themselves as well, because that's kind of how the process begins. Yeah, absolutely. I know for, for myself, I take pride in acknowledging an important part of my identity. So 
at least for me, being gay is a part of me. Um, it's not the only thing that's important, but it's a pretty significant part of my identity that's also happens to be different from a lot of other people, um, which can make things more challenging and also be stressful at times. Um, I also think Pride Month is important because it's a time for us all really to embrace our identity, to remember all of the work and the progress that has gone on, um, as Bob was mentioning, in terms of achieving equal rights and also acknowledging that there's a lot of work still left to be done. Um, even now, as we're seeing different bills come across that are taking away rights from transgender individuals. And um, so there, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Uh, the other thing that I think is also really important is that uh, we, we can, um, especially for young people, to know that it's okay to be gay and it's okay to have different sexual identities and gender identities because right now there's likely youth out there as well as adults who are really struggling with accepting themselves as well as having others accept them. Um, so Susie was mentioning this um, a little bit ago uh, in terms of coming out and disclosing one's identity. Um, what does it mean to come out and and what do you think about timing and who to come out to and when, when that's a good idea? It might be good to start with a definition. What does coming out actually mean? Well, coming out is the process by which someone accepts and identifies their gender identity or their sexual orientation. And it's about sharing that with others, really. But also, I think it begins with coming out to yourself. So certainly that's a a uh, term we're familiar with in the community. When is it, when are you able to actually come out to yourself? When do you accept that maybe your um, gender identity or your sexual orientation is maybe different to those that are around you? Um, and it's a lifelong process as well. Sometimes people think that we come out once and that's it, but we're coming out a lot to lots of different people in lots of different situations. And we may be out in some situations, like for me, I'm recently out at work before I was never out at work, but I was in my personal life. So it's you can't make an assumption that if somebody is out in one area and for healthcare, that's particularly important for us. It may be that somebody is out to us as healthcare professionals, but not to other people. So it's good to ask. Yeah, I think that's that is super important, Susie. I know. Yeah. Um, Geez, at this point, it's probably t almost 20 years ago when I came out and um, I had my own struggles with coming to that place of self-acceptance of being gay. And um, I ended up coming out in Cancun, Mexico to a group of uh, seven of my heterosexual male friends. And um, while I was on vacation, I started experiencing panic attacks, um, pretty severe to the point where I had went to the hospital. Um, and in, for me, that was this ultimate sign of it's time to get this out there. It's time to, to come out and to let others know. And I remember doing that and really being embraced by my friends that I was with. And it did feel like this uh, huge lift off of me. Um, and then that process, as Susie was mentioning, continued. Um, I think it's important for people to try to come out and be as comfortable as they can with their medical providers. And um, I've had many young folks um, come out for the first time in the office, almost to try it on and see yeah. when you ask the questions, sometimes people are surprised that doctors are asking or showing this interest. Um, and I think it's really important that we as providers really know all about our patients. As Adam said, um, it, it's not the everything about a person, but it is a large part of their identity and being able to give appropriate care to a patient or to their family, it's really important that you understand who the person is and different areas about themselves, what they enjoy to do, who they like to hang out with, who they're attracted to and how they identify is also a very big part of that. So trying to find a, a provider that you feel comfortable to sharing this information really can help get you better care too. Yeah. I think it's important that we also be sensitive to um, the fact that people come out to all sorts of people. And as, as, as everyone has said so far, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. It's, we see the movies of coming out to the parents and how difficult that is. 
Yeah. But coming out at work can be equally difficult. Coming out with different groups of friends, um, in my case, coming out to my teenage children uh, 20 some years ago was, uh, was, was probably the hardest thing I had to do. And as providers, we need to be sensitive that people may be at different stages um, in that, that coming out process. I think one of the things that brings us together and makes us a little bit unique as a community is the fact that we do have to grapple with this coming out question. Um, and it's always an interesting discussion point um, when, a, when a group of LGBTQ people get together. How did you come out? And frankly, I think it's a point of support among the community. Absolutely. Um, it also makes me think about safety and safety concerns too. So when um, Susie had mentioned that that first step of being able to have that self acknowledgement um, and that self acceptance, being able to come out to yourself and accept that, and then that next step is really finding supportive others. So you want to try and think about who in your circle, whether it be within your family or within your friendship network. Or maybe it's even external outside of that, uh, speaking to a mental health provider that you might feel safe coming out to. And then once you can start building that network of safe, supportive individuals, that that's tremendously helpful. At least I, I have found that with um, being able to come out more fully. Um, so what are some good ways to deal with stress when we're feeling overwhelmed, um, where we're still living through a pandemic and hopefully getting towards the end of it. And um, so we have lots of stress going on in different areas of life, but in terms of managing one's sexuality or gender identity, um, as well as just stress in general, what would you say are some ways to deal with stress? Adam, you know a trick somebody taught me a couple of years ago um, that works, I think, very effectively. Um, Think back six months ago or a year ago and try to remember some of the things that were making you so stressful um, at that time. And in many, many cases, we can't even remember what they were. We had some sense we were stressed, but we don't really remember the, uh, the details. And in realizing that often what we're going through really is, is temporary um, and that there is a future ahead of us. And I think particularly for Younger people don't have a lot of life experience yet to know that some of the stress they're going through, they will get through it and provide that that reassurance that that the future is is always there and looking back will be will be a lot easier. Thanks, Bob, for sharing that. And I think tuning into um, your self care, do something consciously. Uh, for yourself because that's important too because sometimes we can forget to do that weeks can roll by months can roll by so really think about what's important to you I mean two things I like to do is I like to run which I've been able to maintain and listen to music so those are two things I do to care for myself I think it's also really important to tap into a support network who is that person, that one or two people that you can talk to or you can turn to if you're really feeling stressed or anxious or down or you're you're really feeling um, like, like there's a crisis going on in your life? It may be a family member, a parent or a sibling or a cousin. It may be a teacher or a guidance counselor. It may be a medical provider um, or even just some good friends. But having someone there that you can talk to and knowing who that is, I think is really helpful. Um, there's also, even if it's three in the morning and you're feeling very alone with people, uh, you know, your friends and family sleeping, you can always reach out to something like the, um, the National Suicide Hotline, for example. Um, or locally here, we have uh, DASH, which is, uh, provides a hotline that's available 24 seven so that you do have someone to talk to at any hour. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the support network is so important and um, you'll also find, and we have a, a comprehensive website, stonybrookmedicine.edu slash LGBTQ. And within that website, um, you'll see it on the bottom of the screen there. And within that website, there is a resource page. And so know that you're not alone in this journey. There are people out there who support you and who are here to help guide you through the process of um, being you. Um, so the next question that I have is around health disparities and some of the challenges that the community faces. And we know that 
the LGBTQ community continues to face many challenges as it relates to uh, their health. So what would you say are some of those um, problems and perhaps unique problems that the LGBTQ community faces? Suicide is a big concern for the LGBTQ community, definitely. Um, sometimes people from the community can feel disconnected from others, particularly if they're grappling with their sexual identity or their sexual orientation. And feeling disconnected is a huge risk indicator for suicide. So, and in fact, we know in New York State that the LGBTQ plus community does feature in the suicide statistics tragically. So actually we're um, a group that's identified in the suicide prevention strategy to, to get people services and linked in, as Ali said, it's really, really important to identify people that you can talk to. Even in routine preventative care, we see that um, LGBTQ individuals may avoid going to the doctor if they're feeling sick or if they, if they have a medical need because they may feel embarrassed or concerned or worried about going to see a physician or how that appointment may go. Routine preventative care like, like routine cancer screens, for example, a pap smear, a mammogram, um, a prostate exam for, uh, to evaluate for prostate cancer, colonoscopy. Actually, all of those preventative screenings are much lower in LGBTQ individuals um, compared to their peers. And that's concerning because all of those things help catch uh, disease um, in the early stage. Yeah. Yeah. So not only are, are there concerns about suicide um, and some of these physical health problems, especially from a preventative standpoint, um, we also know around other mental health problems like substance abuse problems, anxiety, depression, um, also homelessness is are significant problems that the community faces, especially among youth. Um, so these are all really important problems to be aware of. And um, as healthcare leaders, it's also our responsibility to figure out how we can better meet the needs of the community. We'll talk more a little bit um, about that later. So Pride Month is not just for members of the LGBTQ community. Um, it's a time for all people because allies are also really important as well. And so what does it mean um, to be an ally? Uh, what does allyship mean? How do you become an ally to the community? Um, I, I can answer that. As I myself is an ally, am an ally for the, uh, for the community, and I think it's incredibly important. Uh, one of the things that I try to do as a healthcare provider, I can show you on my ID badge, for example. Um, this is the ID that I wear every day in the office, and it has a ribbon, and it also has my pronoun pin, she, her, right on the front. So one of the first things when a patient walks into our office and wonders, is this an office that's going to be inclusive? Is this an office that's going to be able to understand me, understand who I am and what my needs may be? Before I even open my mouth, that's something that they see to say, yes, this person may understand what I'm doing, what I'm talking about or who I am or what I may need. So I think allyship is a big part of that. Showing support, showing that although I myself don't identify um, as gay um, or transgender, I understand what some people are going through. I'm here to listen, I'm here to help, and I'm really here to try to advance, um, in this situation, advance um, the healthcare for and improve really access to care. So I think it's about being supportive. Thanks, Allie. Um, the, the other thing that I think is really important as it relates to allyship is uh, being able to stand up for others in the community, right? So when you when you hear people saying negative things, being able to say, hey, you know, that's not really appropriate. Um, that's not okay. Um, so really having one another's back is super important. Um, Susie, I know you wanted to share something. Sorry, I uh, jumped in there. That's okay. I was gonna say being open, as um, Ali was saying, you know, this is, oh, it's on the other side. This is um, a sign that actually it's okay to talk to you because, People don't access healthcare because they feel that they're going to be stigmatized. And they're also not sure how to have that embarrassing conversation when somebody refers to um, someone incorrectly or that they don't like. So, you know, that that is difficult. So actually being open and honest with science helps. That's a good opener. Yeah. Adam, I think I'd like to add to that also that um, 
you know, Ali's comments about allies is, is, is so gratifying for everyone in the community. And we look for allies. And I also like to challenge the LGBTQ community to be allies within themselves. Also, as we've seen the transgender community is, has been through a very, very difficult struggle. And sometimes we aren't allies to ourselves. And there's uh, some traditions of, uh, of discrimination even within the LGBTQ community. So it's practicing allyship with among ourselves, I think is equally important. Thanks, Bob. And uh, relate, related to that, as, as you, you all will see next to our names in parentheses is also our pronouns. Um, so as it relates to, to gender identity and expression, using pronouns is one way that we can uh, express our gender identity. And so we're working really hard to share our pronouns more and more to acknowledge that not everybody uses he and she pronouns and that some people do choose to use more gender neutral pronouns. Um, and respecting that is also really important. And it, and just to note on that, Adam, it's it's okay to get something wrong but it's noticing that. So tune into how the person is presenting in front of you as well and think, oh, I said something that was incorrect or inappropriate and I'm sorry. Can we discuss that? What, what would be, what would you prefer? What's your preference? Or what are you more comfortable with? You know, that's okay too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so next, uh, switching gears a little bit, we've already touched upon this. I'd like for us to discuss the process of engaging in healthcare for LGBTQ individuals and, and starting that conversation between the patient and provider. And Ali started talking a little bit about this earlier. Uh, before we go there, I just wanted to present uh, uh, some stats. Um, some research shows that 56% of lesbian, gay, bisexual individuals, and 70% of transgender adults have experienced discrimination in healthcare. One in four transgender adults report avoiding a necessary medical visit because of fear of being mistreated. In addition to that, when we look among youth, around 25 to 29% of LGBTQ youth are report being out to their provider. Um, so these numbers are pretty astonishing, um, astonishingly low and concerning because if my provider doesn't know about my sexual orientation or gender identity, there may be important aspects of my healthcare that are being neglected. So how do you, how do you start having that conversation around one sexual orientation and gender identity? I think one of the things that we're trying to do is, um, for example, with the pronouns, when I introduce myself to a new patient, I introduce myself as Dr. Eliskew and I use she, her pronouns. And that kind of opens the door for somebody to introduce themselves and tell me what pronouns they use. So I don't have to try to guess or put them in an uncomfortable place. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of uh, being able to disclose your own pronouns, working to make that the patient feel comfortable as the provider. I think in healthcare generally, having discussions like this are vital. Um, just a few years ago, no one, were, no one was doing this and, and providing that education for the broad base of people um, that are providing healthcare. Uh, healthcare organizations are incredibly complex. And you think about, we've got people who have very, very minimal education, uh, all the way up to neurosurgeons and people who have spent their whole lives being educated, and yet um, we don't educate anyone on how to um, how to have these conversations. And um, it's important that we begin that these conversations, emphasizing that these conversations are important and essential to providing good health care. And for too long, there's been an assumption that the right instruments or the right facility or the right medication are all it takes for health care. Having open conversation with, uh, with patients is uh, equally as vital and putting them at ease, all people at ease. And I think that um, educating and pressing this education among all providers is, is, the, is the most important first step we can be doing in health care. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 
that it also extends to the preferred name. Um, certainly, I've spent much of my career working in psychiatric services, and I was taught as a young nurse that you're Miss Marriott and you address people by Mr. or Mrs. And actually, that's not what people want at all. So rather than me make an assumption that that's the way I should address somebody, I ask. I say, I prefer Susie. What's your preference? How would you like me to address you? And if it's Mr. Smith, then Mr. Smith it will be. But I like Susie. And and that's kind of an icebreaker as well. Yeah. And it really gets back to some is essential core values of respect and respecting the individual. Um, I can remember back in my, my early 20s as a, as a young gay man going to um, the primary care doctor for my annual visit and repeating over and over again in my head, coaching myself to come out and telling myself, you know, just, just let him know you're gay. Just let him know you're gay. Um, and how stressful that was for me. Um, on top of that, uh, the stress associated with asking for an HIV test, you know, in order to make sure that I'm taking care of myself um, and getting screened for SDIs. Um, so it's, it's not only, um, uh, the responsibility of the individual to, to also be an advocate for themselves. Yeah. But as healthcare providers and healthcare leaders, we also have to make sure that we're being sensitive around the questions that we're asking, making sure that we're asking about gender identity, we're asking about sexual orientation, so that we don't leave all of that to the patient to bring forth. Not automatically assume that someone's um, spouse is a, is a man or a woman um, or that their family situation is one way or the other. Um, I ultimately believe this will make us better providers for, for everyone. Um, uh, in, the, in the past, we used to uh, make assumptions about someone's race based on their appearance, and that's, that's not the right thing to do. We really need to be asking people um, and that's what we should be doing in healthcare anyway. We should be probing and learning as much as we can about the people in front of us in order to provide the best healthcare possible. And that's an important gateway into healthcare as well. If we can coach ourselves and learn how to approach somebody at that initial introduction, then our patients are more likely to be open and honest with us. We've given them permission. We've let them know that that's okay. Yeah, and again, it doesn't put all of that onus on the patient because it's stressful. It can be incredibly stressful, especially if you're not um, out to lots of people. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of engaging with healthcare and, and building one's treatment team, so if you think about all the different types of providers that one might need uh, to properly take care of health, what are some of the qualities that an individual should look for when choosing a healthcare provider who has special training in the LGBTQ community? I think it's important that providers, that they look for someone who is uh, open and uh, inclusive and asks open questions and is really non-judgmental. So when patients tell me, pretty much anything of whether it's who they're in a relationship with or how they identify, um, there's no judgment. And uh, I feel like sometimes patients will almost uh, give me some information to see how I react, to see if I'm going to see, seem shocked or question it. And I think just kind of, you know, taking it in as I, now I understand more about who you are and, that, and sometimes even saying thank you for sharing because I can imagine that would be really difficult to share, especially if you find out that they haven't been out before and this might be the first time that they're coming out. Um, so it's someone who I think really understands and asks the right questions. You know, I look at the three of you, I'm the non-clinician in the group, and I look at the three of you as clinicians. And I think, um, and in the past, I've heard providers or clinicians say, oh, this is all too difficult. I can't, I can't manage this. I just, I just have to be a doctor. I just have to be a nurse. I can't be worrying about these things because it's too, it's too difficult for me. And yet the three of you are modeling the behavior and seem to have incorporated into your clinical practices very well, very well, and don't seem one bit stressed. In fact, seem better practitioners as a result. And I would look for the practitioners that model the sorts of behavior that you yourselves are practicing. Thanks, Bob. 
Um, yeah, I think that having that empathy and being uh, engaging with somebody who is open and, uh, and asking questions that are sensitive is really important. Um, all right. Um, so in terms of identifying some of these providers, uh, where, where can folks find providers who have experience working with patients who identify um, as LGBTQ? Stony Brook Medicine has an um, LGBTQ committee that Adam and I co-chair. And uh, last year we created a, um, a website for the committee. Um, and the website has uh, a bunch of different resources. Adam was referring to it earlier, but one of the one of the uh, tabs has um, a list of providers at Stony Brook Medicine who consider themselves experts, very comfortable um, dealing with different issues, whether it's um, for, for example, um, endocrinologists who feel comfortable managing um, hormone treatments, or um, or. Uh, people in mental health were more comfortable dealing with medical the mental health issues that come up in these populations. So I think that's a really great resource um, to look at that that site. Thanks, Allie. Uh, yeah, we we have this great uh, great website and and resources that are available to the community. So I definitely would encourage folks to check that out. Um, if you're just joining us now. Uh, we are um, representing Stony Brook University Hospitals and talking about healthcare for the LGBTQ population. If you have any questions related to LGBTQ healthcare, please feel free to drop the questions in the chat box, um, any comments, and we will be sure to work on addressing those questions for you throughout this panel. Um, so, one in talking about healthcare providers and sensitive care, one really new an exciting development is the ED Windsor Healthcare Center. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bob, so you can tell us more about the ED Windsor Center, how it came to be, and what services are being offered there. Great. Thanks, Adam, and we really are excited about the ED Windsor Healthcare Center. Just for those of you that may not know, um, ED Windsor is, is, is one, of our, um, one of our pioneers and civil, civil rights pioneers, ED Windsor was one of the plaintiffs in the case that won the right for gay people to be married with the LGBTQ people to be married in the, um, with the Supreme Court. Um, was also um, a local part-time resident and a friend of our healthcare providers here in this community. Um, we took a situation and made lemons from lemonade. We a long time operated a um, made lemonade from lemons. Let me get that, uh, that correct. Um, we had a long time um, HIV AIDS center, the David Rogers Center, which was in a facility here in Southampton. And unfortunately, we lost our lease, had to move, found another site um, larger and a site that we could modernize. Um, and with a larger site, we're able to expand um, and rebranded as the Edie Windsor Healthcare Center um, with the opportunity to add LGBTQ healthcare services beyond HIV and AIDS services, long tradition of excellent care for the HIV AIDS affected and infected uh, population. Um, and those can remain as the Rose Walton care services. But we've been able to recruit a number of physicians to join with our team over there. You're looking at one of them right now, David, uh, Dr. Eric Lella, who is a brand new uh, board certified family practice doctor. Dr. Lella has joined us full time in the center to anchor the healthcare with primary care. Um, Dr. Uh, Lella lives in uh, Hampton Bays with his husband and is very, very energetic and enthused about bringing primary care. We, we've brought in mental health services. We continue with the HIV AIDS services. Um, we are working with the specialists at Stony Brook. Dr. Alescu has been involved uh, with this project from the start as has Dr. Gonzalez. And um, we will be um, incorporating additional services, including care for the transgender community, uh, fertility services, working with our OB gynecologist, uh, the full array of services we'd like to either provide on site or provide an access point to specialists um, throughout throughout the uh, Stony Brook system. It will be the um, the first of its kind health center on uh, Long Island. We hope it will be the first of many. 
um, and we fo- hope that it will provide a uh, an, an increased focus on on providing uh, superior health care for the LGBTQ community. Thanks, Bob. And um, I, I'm super excited about this center. It's so awesome that we're going to have this on Long Island, uh, one of its kind center. Um, so that's really great that we'll be able to provide these unique services. So congrats uh, to you and your team, too, for all the hard work that you guys have put into this. Thank you very much. We're excited. We're, um, we're very excited about it. We'll be uh, looking forward to it and ask anyone who needs health care to please get a hold of us and we can direct them to the center. Yeah. So related to um, to the ED Windsor Center and to really focusing on improving healthcare for LGBTQ individuals, Stony Brook has launched a first of its kind survey as well, the LGBTQ Health Needs Assessment Survey. And so Dr. Elskew is the PI of this survey, which is launched throughout all of Long Island. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ali, to, to talk more about the Health Needs Assessment Survey. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, we're very excited that the survey was launched at the beginning of June and will be running throughout June, throughout Pride Month. Um, It is the first of its kind. Um, It's a a community health needs assessment survey for LGBTQ adults um, who live in Nassau or Suffolk County or go to school, uh, university or technical school on Nassau or Suffolk. And we're really trying to learn more about our community, learn more about what experiences they've had in their life or in the healthcare system already, um, what uh, resources they may need that they uh, they don't currently have access to, um, and how they kind of feel like their their health is overall. We're really trying to understand more about our community so that we can really address the, what what needs may be lacking and try to improve access to care across the island. Uh, so the link is down at the bottom of the uh, screen right now, stonybrookmedicine.a edu slash lgbtq slash survey. It's um, completely anonymous. So if you go to that link, it can take you to the survey. Um, We don't know who does take the survey or who doesn't. It doesn't collect any identifying information about you or about the computer that you use or your email address. And it takes about 15 minutes to complete it. Um, So we're really trying to get more and more information. Please um, complete it if you're able to or send it out to anybody else. Feel free to send that link along. um, Or there's also a QR code that is available uh, that takes you right to the survey. I think it's important to note also that we've worked with over 20 partner organizations across Long Island to help us develop the survey, different different sorts of LGBTQ organizations and allies to help us develop the, the survey and also actively promote it. We want to encourage as broad participation in the survey as possible. Great. Thanks, Bob. And I know we, we've had over 500 LGBTQ individuals already complete the survey. So please join us in completing the survey so that we can increase our numbers and hear from as many people as possible across Long Island. Um, we're going to show you a short clip right now um, about why it's important to take the survey. Great healthcare is more than providing the right treatment. It is being treated right. Make your voice heard. Take the LGBTQ plus health needs survey now. So yeah, as you saw, this is really important. So please, um, please log on and take the survey when time permits and share it with your friends, family, and colleagues who are part of the community. Um, So we did get a a question from Jennifer, which was asking um, about local support groups for parents of kids in the community. Any local support groups? Um, I don't know of any uh, specific support groups, um, but I do know that uh, there are some, on our resource page, for example, there are some um, mental health providers across Long Island who um, who specialize in helping adolescents or families w- with um, kind of understanding their identity and, and accepting where they're at and accepting um, their sexual orientation. Uh, so they may be a good resource for, uh, for, for groups. 
I'll say out here on the east end in the uh, in the ED Windsor Healthcare Center, we do have an amazing um, social worker who is incredibly adept at finding the, the right resources for people also. So if a, a parent is uh, uh, looking for a resource for their child um, and uh, she would be, uh, Maureen is her name, Maureen would be more than uh, thrilled, um, give the center a call and ask for Maureen and, and Maureen, I know, will throw herself heart and soul into finding the right resource for, for, uh, for the family and child. Yeah. The, the, other, the other large national organization that is really important to highlight here is PFLAG. Um, so PFLAG is a national organization set up to help um, parents, families, friends of lesbians and gays of the LGBTQ community to provide support for parents and families and friends. So we do have, I believe, a local chapter on Long Island. You can check out pflag.org and find out more information about the support resources through that organization. Um, with the pandemic, lots of things are virtual now. And so you'll likely be able to find some virtual support groups um, through there as well. And the Trevor Project and the Safe Zone Project are also really good websites that signpost you to other resources as well. Among our partner organizations with the survey too, and those are listed on the website, there are, there are several organizations that are advocates for LGBTQ youth as well. Um, and I can't remember those names off the top of my head, but please, uh, please look on our website. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, so one thing that we, we haven't talked much about yet is um, care for transgender individuals and gender diverse individuals. Um, so uh, when we think about gender, uh, gender identity is the sense of being man, woman, or somewhere in between, uh, which is different from birth sex, the sex that we were assigned at birth, uh, which is really based on genitalia and uh, what, what doctors see between your legs when you're born. Um, so gender identity is more of that internal sense of being man, woman, or in between, and gender expression is the way in which we choose to express our gender identity. So we talked about pronouns as well as the use of chosen or preferred names, clothing perhaps can be another way of expression. So what would you say are some of the first steps that uh, one might consider in taking um, their journey with supporting their own gender identity and expression, especially when one gender identity may be different from the birth, the sex that they were assigned at birth. I guess I'm a little bit biased being a healthcare professional, but I would say maybe talking to your provider would be a good first step. I know, Ali, what, what do you think? Um, I think what, what I've seen in a lot of um, young adolescents is they frequently will uh, start talking about it or maybe even start coming out to their friends before they talk to their families or even their healthcare provider and almost try to gauge the response that they get and um, kind of gauge how they feel about that too. Um, I have had patients say, uh, I haven't come out to anyone except a couple friends in school, but I will go to school and then even change my outfit in school or change my appearance in school and almost try it on a little bit and see how I feel about it. Uh, and then come home and I, I, I'm still who I, who my family thinks I am. Um, so I think it's steps and I, I think every individual has a different journey and the first steps I think are different for everybody. Um, yeah. Sometimes it is starting with who you feel is that person that you can talk to and you can support who will support you um, and, and starting trying it out, out a little bit. I'd say for most young people, it's initially starting with um, changing their appearance, changing what what their clothing may be, or um, changing their haircut, or wearing makeup, or changing the way their nails look. Um, just trying to try things on before they start any seeing any providers for medication or hormones or um, or even surgery. Yeah, it's interesting as as a as a society we have certain. Um, stereotypical thoughts about what it means to be male or what it means to be female, um, even when it comes to the clothing that one wears, hairstyles. Um, so I think, as Ali was saying, some of those first steps is one, for, so finding supportive others, 
but then also being able to express your gender identity in different ways. Um, the other thing that, that comes up is then taking that a step further when we start thinking about different medical procedures um, and treatments like hormone therapy or gender affirmation surgeries that then may help with um, gender expression and gender affirmation as well. Um, so along those lines, um, do transgender individuals have to start hormone therapy or undergo um, any specific surgeries? I think that's a really important point that no, they don't. And we shouldn't assume that just because someone identifies as transgender or even non-binary that they have uh, started hormone therapy or, or have had surgery or that they want to. It's, it's I think yep. each, each individual kind of decides how they want to express themselves and what they're comfortable with. Yeah, that's a great point, Ali, because I think there are some common misconceptions that if somebody identifies as transgender, that automatically means that they're going to start hormone therapy or that they're going to have certain surgeries, which isn't really the case. Um, so we want to be respectful of an individual's right and as well as their ability to choose how they wish to express themselves to, to others. But it is important that individuals do share with their healthcare provider whether they are on hormones or not, or whether they're considering it, whether they have had surgery or not, because we do need to understand what medications or hormones are in their system so we can interpret their lab results or understand what tests they may need and know if they've had surgery or not so that we can monitor, let's say, if someone has any complications from surgery. Um, so that it is important to have that discussion with your provider. Absolutely. I think as providers, it's important to recognize that this is not a one-way street for everybody. That this is a uh, look. We're all in. We're all swimming around in the whirlpool of life, and people are going to move back and forth um, at different points in their lives. And we need to respect that and constantly keep asking and, and questioning where they are on that journey. And it may not be a straight line for for many people. That's really important. We must be aware that we can provide that safe space to discuss those issues, we really must. Absolutely. And we had a question around um, uh, hormone therapy. So um, does an individual have to wait until they're 18 to start hormone therapy? It's kind of a common misconception is that actually, no, you don't. Um, especially for um, younger adolescents as they're first starting to go through puberty, um, that can be very uh, upsetting for an individual as their body starts to change in a way that they they themselves don't identify. Um, so there are medications that um, endocrinologists usually are the ones that prescribe it that can kind of halt the puberty and give patients and families some time to figure out what their next steps are, figure out if they do want to start something like um, further hormone therapy or not. And that medication is completely reversible. So that can be started and then stopped at any point. And if it stops, then general puberty would continue. Um, and even um, if someone under the age of 18 does want to pursue um, uh, hormone therapy, they would require parental consent and uh, usually a letter from a therapist as well. Uh, but they can consider, they can be, um, get the prescription medication under 18. And that's usually a, with a with the assistance of a pediatric endocrinologist. Thanks, Ali. Um, and this makes me think. A back a back a few months ago, we had a a transgender health conference at Stony Brook, and so there are many great presentations about transgender health care. Um, and those videos can be asked, accessed through our website as well, the stonybrookmedicine.edu slash LGBTQ. Um, and on our YouTube channel, you can take a look at those uh, presentations, which will give you a, a lot of rich information related to transgender healthcare. So I wanted us to talk a little bit about prevention, you know, uh, in, instead of focusing on um, diseases as they come up, there are ways that we can prevent a lot of health problems from developing. So as a person who identifies in the LGBTQ community, what are the things I can do to prevent diseases and also promote wellness? I think that's a great question, Adam. And just like what Bob was saying, where the kind of the backbone of the ED Windsor Center is the primary care physician, 
Um, I think a lot of this starts with a primary care physician that you're open with, that you share uh, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, so that they can explain to you um, what what preventative services you should be getting? What tests should you be getting? What vaccines should you be getting specifically based on um, how you identify or different activities you may be engaging in? What specific blood tests, like Adam mentioned earlier, uh, HIV test, um, or even something like HIV prep, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So understanding that um, that primary care doctors can have a big role in this and, um, and that you should try to be open about it um, so that they can kind of uh, help with that those preventative services. Great, thanks, Sally. So having those having those discussions with your healthcare providers is really important. It comes back to that first step of disclosure, right? And feeling comfortable to have some of those conversations, which is a bit linked to um, a question that we have from Tracy, which is um, understanding change occurs one step at a time. Why? What? what would you recommend as a first actionable step that healthcare providers can do towards creating a safe and inclusive environment? I think being bold and starting the conversation um, within, within your organization, uh, whatever that is, whether it's a medical office or a, uh, or a hospital or whatever, whatever organization, it begins with a conversation. It begins with a, uh, a recognition that, that, that there are real issues of um, access and equality um, and quality um, in providing healthcare to the LGBTQ community and starting a conversation and a, and a real honest assessment of how are, we, how are we doing things? How can we do them better? Where are those barriers within our own organization? Um, and working, working from the inside out, um, how can we do better, um, I think is ultimately important. That was the genesis for what we've been doing um, and recognizing that uh, before, we, uh, before we go out and uh, criticize others, we really ought to start with our, own, with our own house and do some of our own work internally. Um, so having those honest, straightforward conversations at all levels of the organization is important. Thank you, Bob. So that conversation is really, really important. And it can start with education. So Adam and I have been doing smaller educational supervisory discussions, maybe around individual patient care as well. So let's start here, because you need to examine your prejudices in order to be aware of them and to manage them differently. So you have to be open. So we always say that this is a safe, no judgment space for you to bring things up so that we can discuss it and then understand why that might not be appropriate. Yep, absolutely. And, and thank you, Susie. The, the other thing that Ali had mentioned earlier too, which is um, visibility is really important as I search for my pin. Um, so things like this, like a rainbow pin, uh, welcome signs, yeah. is really helpful to have people feel comfortable in the office that you can have those conversations. Um, I did wanna to get to one last question, which is um, about PrEP. And um, so Ali, I'm gonna throw this one over to you. What is HIV PrEP? And is this available at Stony Brook? Yeah, thanks, Adam. So HIV PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is a medication that can be taken one pill once a day to help prevent uh, contracting HIV. So it's an important medication for everybody to know about, but I think especially in the LGBTQ population um, because rates of HIV have been higher in this, in this population. Um, so PrEP is available at Stony Brook. Um, the website is down at the bottom of the screen, stonybrookmedicine.edu slash PrEP. Um, there are many providers spread out um, across Long Island through Stony Brook who provide PrEP and are able to um, prescribe the medication and screen for any, um, any uh, HIV infection or illness and um, just help prevent infections. So it's a great service to know about. And obviously I'll throw a plug in for the ED Windsor Healthcare Center. The services are available there as well. Great, thanks so much, Bob and Allie. Um, related here, I just want to say that, you know, Stony Brook is here for the LGBTQ community and we're really committed to making a difference in LGBTQ individuals' lives and, and to support their health care. 
um, just over a year ago, Stony Brook Southampton and Stony Brook University Hospital were both named healthcare equality leaders for LGBTQ care by the Human Rights Campaign for 2020 to 22. And we are super excited to have our partners now at ELI, Eastern Long Island Hospital, also apply for this de designation this year um, so that we can all come together and really provide the best care possible to our patients. Um, and in addition to that, also make sure that we're supporting our employees and staff who are part of the LGBTQ community as well. Um, Ali, I know uh, we've worked really closely on this together. Anything that you wanted to share about um, what this survey means, what this designation means, um, and why it's important? Yeah, I'm very, very excited to say that we've got this certification. Um, uh, there are only, uh, I think, 460 sites uh, across the U.S. that have gotten it. Only about 65% of the places that applied for it were able to get that leadership in healthcare designation. So we're very, very proud that um, Stony Brook and uh, uh, Stony Brook Southampton both got it this year and looking forward to ELI joining us next year. Um, I think it really demonstrates our commitment to provide high quality, inclusive, equitable care to our, our entire community throughout Suffolk County. Um, it involved changes in the electronic medical record, changes in signage and policies across the hospital and um, across the, the out ambulatory sites as well. And um, the administration, administrative folks were, were very excited to partner with us and help make these changes. So I, I think it really shows uh, Stony Brook's commitment to our, uh, to our community. Absolutely, thank you. Um, all right, so um, for folks tuning in, if again, if you have um, any comments or any needs that you might identify from the, as, a, as a person who is part of the LGBTQ community, please share that with us. Also, please be sure to take the LGBTQ Health Needs Assessment Survey. We wanna hear from you and we wanna make sure that we can provide the best care possible. So in, in wrapping up, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists here for sharing their expertise as well as sharing their own personal stories. And to all of you who joined us today, thank you. Um, also a big thank you to our social media manager and producer, Carly Weinstein. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, so again, please remember to take the LGBTQ Health Needs Assessment Survey, spread the word to others in the community, and for more information, you can also visit our website, stonybrookmedicine.edu slash LGBTQ. Uh, thanks again. Take care and happy Pride. Yep. My name is Chris Tanaka. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Director for LGBTQ Services. At LGBTQ Services, we like to organize all of the things that we do into three main areas. Educate, which is educating about LGBTQ folks, as well as uh, within LGBTQ communities. Advocate for both campus-wide policy change, as well as advocating on behalf of individual students, and Celebrate, which is to show how amazing our LGBTQ communities are and um, all of the wonderful things about them that make them uh, special. Here I co-chair our LGBTQ committee for the hospital and also chair our faculty diversity ambassadors. Council. So we're really working on uh, having diversity be widespread throughout uh, the departments, throughout the campus, uh, addressing health disparities for different populations uh, in the community. I'm Adam Gonzalez. I'm an openly gay clinical psychologist. So I joined Stony Brook in 2012 as a research scientist. In 2015, I started the Mind Body Clinical Research Center with the support of Dr. Amin Parsi. And then most recently, I uh, became the Director of Behavioral Health for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. I identify as a man, as a trans man. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm in the School of Medicine. I'm a first year medical student, but I have a PhD right now. When I first came to Stony Brook, I also received the Turner Fellowship, which helped support underrepresented people in graduate school education. And they had a welcome dinner, and 
I felt very supported in knowing that that was a great resource, as well as they were supportive of people in a similar experience to me, whether it be gender identity, sexual orientation, race or ethnicity. It was an inclusive community. From the first moment that I got to Stony Brook, I always felt extremely included here. I felt extremely comfortable and extremely welcome. We have, you know, a fairly diverse class that we have here, ranging, you know, all different kinds of ethnicities, gender, both identity, gender expression. Myself as an openly gay resident, we have other openly gay residents. No one I know has ever really faced any kind of an issue with it. It's always been a welcome environment. So that really spoke to me. The quality of the education here, and particularly for my and the surgical education, is second to none. I think I've got to a point in my life where I'm comfortable with my sexuality. It's not a secret. I decided that a long time ago. I didn't want it to be a secret. So in my work life, I can be a resource. And I want staff to be able to talk to me or ask me questions honestly about patient care issues. We have children who are admitted who have identifying as the opposite gender and are thinking about being transgender and trying that on really and the staff can use me as a resource to talk that through certainly with pronouns and how they can involve the parents as well so those sort of issues come up and I think being open gives them a resource someone they can go to which is helpful and I'm okay with that now. I'm the Associate Director of Nursing for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioural Health um, and I identify as a queer woman. In the future, I'm looking forward to starting more in the clinic. So over the summer, I will be in various internal medicine clinics and pediatric clinics. So I'm looking forward to interacting with patients and we're gonna do more outreach because Trans Day of Remembrance is coming up in November. We wanna bring in people from the community to talk about their experiences with physicians and uh, what the university and the School of Medicine can do to better support them. I like being involved and in helping to bring about more inclusive care, better future medicine, and treatment of the LGBTQ community. We recently submitted our application to the Human Rights Campaign to become a healthcare leader in LGBTQ care. Uh, so I think that will be a great addition to Stony Brook Medicine to serve the LGBT community and address uh, health disparities for that population here. I think Stony Brook has a lot to look forward to in the future as we start to consider folks in all of their identities, gender, sexuality, race, faith, ability, all of those things uh, make individuals unique. And as we create more spaces and opportunities and environments that feel comfortable for people, the more they're going to be able to shine and the more we'll be able to learn from one another and be able to see the world through various different lenses. Now the future is looking bright. I feel like I have a really good training base coming out of Stony Brook and uh, I feel comfortable and confident going forward.